I want to remind you of something, first of all. I told you that I got in some trouble uh, a week ago when I was preaching the gospel in a different setting, and uh, I was still celebrating the, uh, the change in the United Methodist Church on all things related to the gay issue. We've taken out that ugly language from the Book of Discipline, and I told people this, and I had only uh, one person walk out, but others may have been offended. Uh, we need to just, we need to tell the truth. We need to tell the truth. And this is a truth-telling sermon today. It's going to point out some things that are obvious. First of all, I want us to know this, and this is very important to know. There is no one in this er on this earth who has been protected from making a mistake who never made a mistake other than Christ our blessed Lord. He never failed anybody yet and never will. And he, he, never, he never made a mistake. But that doesn't cover everybody else in the scripture. It certainly doesn't cover the blessed Paul because the, the best way to handle that passage in which Paul talks about same-sex relations is to simply say, and that I see people try to parse the verbs and move one word here and another word there, and if you look at it this way, it may not say quite what it seems to say. He says what he says. That's the first thing. Number two, he was wrong. We have to be willing to say that is wrong, that is not right. It is incorrect. We don't blame him for it because he was a typical first century Jewish guy and this is the way his whole society looked at it. And yes, we would expect him to be wrong and when he was wrong, God did not strike him with a bolt of lightning. And God had not straightened out everything in that boy's head. He preached the gospel and he preached it profoundly and he was wrong about that. That's what I want us to understand. That anybody in this world other than Jesus Christ can make a mistake. Here's our scripture reading today. I hadn't intended to read this little introduction. Where's the clock? Oh, there's the clock. I need to keep an eye on it. I know you want me to keep an eye on it, okay? Uh, there was a kid who went to church. I have no time to tell this story. There was a kid who went to church. And he was uh, looking around. They hadn't been to church very often. And he said, uh, uh, Daddy, what's that, uh, uh, what's that, what's that uh, thing at the front of the church? I don't, he said, well, that's the baptismal font, son. Yes, yes. Well, wh wh what's, the, what, what's, that, what's that table? He said, well, that, that's, that's where we're going to take communion, son. I said, and what does it mean when the preacher gets up and takes his watch off and puts it on the uh, stand in front of him, and the father said, doesn't mean a darn thing, son. <laughs> well, I'll try to make it mean a darn thing if I, if I possibly can. I hadn't intended to read this part to you, but it's so fascinating because the book of Acts is actually the second book of two books written by Luke. The first one is the Luke's gos gospel, and then the early church decided to stick John's gospel in between book one and book two. And the second one is the book of Acts. And here's the way Luke introduced the book of Acts. In my former book, that's his gospel about Jesus Christ, Theophilus, we don't know who Theophilus was. I wrote about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And after his suffering, and after he presented himself to, uh, to them and gave them convincing proof that he was in fact alive, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and 40 nights about the kingdom of God and spoke to them about it. On occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them uh, this command, do not leave Jerusalem, Wait here until the gift of my Father has promised you, which you have heard me speak about. And that gift from the Father was coming a week later, or days later, 
and it would be what we call Pentecost. Then they, that means all the disciples and, and others, Paul says that Jesus appeared to over 500 witnesses all at one time. Now, was that Pentecost or was that this ascension scripture? We don't know. I'm going to guess it was at the time of his ascension. And by the way, we're going to in just a moment see Jesus taken up, rise up, and into the clouds. Now, does that mean you get to heaven by going up and into the clouds? No. It simply means God knows how to put on a show, okay? And he was marking the end to these 40 days of appearances. Then they gathered around him and asked him, this is in that last appearance with many of the disciples on the side of the Mount of Olives, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, it was the expectation of all of the Hebrew people that when the Messiah came, he was going to ride in on a white horse and drive out all of those nasty Romans and set up the kingdom of Israel again. And this little puny expectation, this very earthly expectation of earthly power is what, after all this time, so many of those who followed him still had in mind, you are the Messiah. When are you going to complete your work as if the work was not already completed on Calvary? So they asked, when are you going to restore Israel to its dominance? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times and date the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, taint none of your business. Don't speculate about things like that. And then he's going to tell them what their job is. And this other job is basically unending. It is the work of the church. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, yes, this little area around you, yes, and in all of Judea, yes, spread it a little farther, yes, and in Samaria, Samaria, <laughs> That's the people that live next door that we hate. We're supposed to tell them about you? Yes. And in case they're missing the point, he says to them, and to the ends of the earth. And as he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And as they were looking up into the sky as he was going, suddenly two men dressed in white stood before him, men of Galilee. They said, why do you stand looking up into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven heaven. And it was always the expectation that Jesus had more work that he had to do and he hadn't completed it. So they never thought about the coming of Christ being that extraordinary event at Pentecost. They were always looking for something bigger how do you get bigger than Pentecost? Let me read you some words from Paul. And we're just going to read them. And we're just going to look at what he says, and we're going to take it seriously, okay? 
We're going to see if it works for us. Now, can you do that in reading the Bible? Can you be reasonable when you read the Bible? Okay. Well, let's, let's do it. Paul says to the Corinthians, to the church in Corinth, he says this. He said, listen, I'm going to show you a mystery. I always love this part. We all like a mystery. He says in the old kingdom, behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all die. Now, he wasn't talking to you and me. He wasn't talking to people a thousand years from now. He was talking to the people in Corinth. What if I said to you this morning, well, it's kind of a nice thought. We will not all die. Some of you will. Let me see which ones. Let me see which side of the church it is. We seem to be divided today. Which side's going to go and which is going to live? You'd think I was nuts because it's a nutty thing to say, but Paul's expectation was that Jesus would come during his lifetime. He said, we will not all die. Some of you may, if you're pretty old, but the rest of us, like me and you younger folks, we, we, we probably won't. He was so certain of this, listen, so certain of this that he told people it would be best if Christians never get married. Now, I could quote the scripture for you. I'm doing it from memory now, but I'm getting it pretty right. He said it would be best, really, if you don't marry at all. It'd be best if you just be like me, like Paul, who was single. He said, with this exception, if you are just burning with lust for that gal or the gal for the guy, whoever, if you're just eaten up with lust, Go ahead, get married. He said, God won't hold it against you. But if you can hold off, it would be best because you're really not going to have time to get married and raise the kids because Jesus is coming soon. Now, throughout history, there have been people who have taken him seriously. Among them, the shakers. You know this wonderful shaker furniture? If you... If you buy any authentic stuff, you're going to pay a, pay a pretty dollar for it. The shakers don't make furniture anymore. Why? You won't tell me why? There are no shakers left. They, just, they did not get married and have children. I remember many years ago, they're talking to, um, I think it was either two or three of the last shakers, and they were in their 90s. And when they died, that was the end of them. And all of these great shaker villages that were built, two or three of them anyway, they're open to the public as museums. Well, if Christians had taken Paul's advice, we wouldn't even have a museum. There wouldn't be any Christian left in the world. But don't blame Paul for that thought. It was an ancient idea that when the Messiah comes, he's going to do more work than Jesus had done on this. And that he's coming, he's coming back soon. Well, soon is not 2,000 years. It's not 3,000 years. So let's recognize the fact that that's a problem. And there are Christians who have in mind a whole strange scenario about the future of the world. There are Christians who carry this in mind. Bear with me. I'm going to read, I'm going to read this to you. I wish it were larger print. I wish we could have a miracle here and it would just expand, but that's not going to happen. Well, after the rapture of the church, now all this is from the book of Revelation. 
And the rapture of the church is when God takes all of us saved people. I say us, don't you? Aren't you glad I included you with me? Yeah. Even our choir. Is God going to take all of the saved people out of the world and he's going to leave everybody else here without any church to witness? They're just going to be here. And then he's going to be mean to them. After the rapture of the church, Christians will be brought before the judgment seat of Christ and he will reward them on the basis of their works they have accomplished. Now, this is not a judgment determine their salvation, but a reward for the labor they have done. The rapture will also inaugurate a period that the Bible characterizes as the great day of his wrath, the great tribulation. This time of unprecedented difficulty will affect Israel and all nations, and its purpose will be to prepare Israel for her Messiah. Well, everybody's already got their Messiah. I want to tell you something. God could not be with us any more than he is with us now in Jesus Christ. And at the end of the tribulation, Jesus Christ will return with the hosts of heaven, as well as the church, to establish the messianic kingdom on earth. And he will set up his headquarters in Jerusalem, Jesus will. And he will rule the earth from Jerusalem. Well, why not from Texas? The weather's a little better in Jerusalem. He will rule the world from Jerusalem. And the nations and their representatives will be judged. And Israel will be restored to her land, never more to be removed. And Christ will reign with firmness. Oh, I always want that from my Lord. Firmness and equity. But he's going to get it right, they say. His kingdom will be marked by material blessing. Material blessing. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. Worked hard all my lifetime. No help from my friends. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Material, material blessing and also spiritual blessing. They go on from there with this whole scenario from the book of Revelation. <laughs> Revelation is kind of like having a script from Star Wars in our Bible. It's like having the Hobbit in the Bible. Yeah, I'm glad it's there. It's a historically important work written in all kinds of strange symbolic language using numerology, a little astrology, stuff Christians don't even believe in. And do you know why so much of the church does not really take the teachings of Jesus seriously? Be because they're messed up in all of this stuff. And this is more fun to them then you love your neighbor as you love yourself. You love those who do not love you. You love even your enemy. You forgive without even being asked. That stuff makes no difference to so many people in the church, and that's why the church generally is so weak and has such a weak witness. And you know, this, this longing to end the world is based on another misconception, which is that the world is a lousy place. The world is a cursed place. 
The world is a bad place and God is just looking for the chance to stop it. When in fact, it is the Holy Scripture that says that when God created it, he said it is good. And I believe that. If it were not good, why would God continue to send us here? This is God's school. And as difficult as it may be, it can be the school of hard knocks, but this is where God continues to send the new soul to learn how to live and to learn how to love. And this is a part of our education. When is God going to shut this thing down? Jesus said, stop talking about that. That's none of your business. What if he doesn't shut it down at all? What if it goes on and on and on and on as scientists tell us it will until the sun burns out? Well, that's none of our business. But God makes use of the world. We have a purpose for being here. God has a purpose for the world. The world is not cursed. Jesus said you may feel like you're cursed, but in truth, however cursed you feel, he said in the Beatitudes, you are blessed. You are blessed. You may not know it, but even if you're persecuted, even if life is terrible for you, even if you're hungry and poor, you are blessed. Blessed by what? To be in this world, to be a child of God, to be living here. So what do I do with the second coming? Well, I don't do much about it. I don't speculate about it. It's in our creeds. We're going to say it from time to time. I frankly never think about it. And here's something else. Since you're a United Methodist, you don't think much about it either. You could be in some churches where every anthem every week is saying that Jesus is coming next Tuesday. That's not the kind of church you're in. And the most important thing I want us to know is that this world is not a bad place. I am thinking about people that I love who are ill and people who are hurting, people who have lost loved ones. And I know that's difficult, but God has never failed us yet. God has got us covered. And next Sunday, we're going to celebrate one of the great days in the life of the church because it was the beginning of the life of the church, Pentecost, in which God dropped heaven on earth and gave the church the power that it needed to run and witness forever. I'm not looking for God to shut this whole thing down. The world is not a failure. It is God's glorious achievement. And you and I are privileged to be here in God's world. And we will be here as long as God wants us here. And what happens next? Paul tells us in something that is very true. When we're absent from this body, we are present with the Lord. And what more could we ever ask than that? Lord, hear our prayer. We are thankful today. Can you join me in this? I mean, just, just in your thinking. Lord, we're thankful today that you have given us this life. Are we thankful? You know the heartache that comes with it, but are we not thankful to be here as long as God wants us here? Looking forward to each day and rejoicing and saying, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And I am going to know that God is with me already and is with me always, for he has risen from the grave. The Lord has risen from the grave.